Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. This is Eniash. This is Katrina. And this is Steven. And today we are interviewing Eliezer Yudkowsky. Eliezer is a de decision theorist and AI researcher who uh, basically kickstarted the rationality movement when he founded LessWrong.com. Let's jump right into it. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How about me? <clears throat> I can hear you as well, though your voice is softer. Um, what if I speak into the microphone? Is, is he connected to the microphone at all? Yeah. Okay, how about this? I can now hear you better, so your voice is still slightly less loud than any else's. How do I actually pronounce your first name, by the way? Oh, yes, I am Ineash. Ineash. Yes. And now, and now I know. Hurrah! I'm Katrina. Nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you as well. And, and uh, did you just hear a clicking sound, by the way? No. Good, no, because no. I just... Because I just switched off my phone and I was wondering if the iPhone clicking sound was being echoed over the connection or if it was just in my headphones. Oh, okay. I think it was just on the headphones. It sounds fine. Okay. <clears throat> Great. And uh, we also have Stephen here. Oh, hi. Who's kind of in charge of the podcast. It's a group effort. Yeah. So, Hello, Stephen. Thank you very much for agreeing to be uh, on the podcast with us. We are really excited about this whole this whole thing. Uh, Katrina, would you like to start since we don't have all that much time? And hey, thank so, you so, so much for spending your time. Yeah. Sorry. So basically, we already introduced you before we um, answered your call. So um, Ooh, should we do it again to make sure that he's on board with this? Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, sure. Why not? Do okay. You... So uh, I introduced you as an AI researcher and decision theorist who basically kickstarted the new rationality movement when you founded LessWrong.com. Would you say that's an acceptable summary? Sure. I mean, like, it was, there was this whole thing with previously overcoming bias, then it became LessWrong.com. But, you know, close enough for government work. Okay. Excellent. Great. Okay, so if you're cool with it, we're just going to jump into some questions for you. Alrighty. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about your rationalist origin story? Are there any real standout moments that you remember from your youth that made you the rationalist you are today? Hmm. If we're talking about like big influences, then surely you're joking, uh, Mr. Feynman. Um, a Step Farther Out by Jerry Pornell, um, a large amount of science fiction with just sort of pro-good reasoning ideals quietly in the background. Um, <clears throat> if I'm looking for like single standout moments, then there was this one point in my life where I noticed the feeling of sort of knowing something wasn't true, hiding it away in the corner of my mind, and managed to generalize over the feeling and be like, aha, this is what it feels like to be hiding something away in the corners of my mind. I'm going to look for everything now. And um, it's like try to sweep out all the hidden corners, just like when I was walking down the street one day. Do you remember what it was? Or you feel comfortable mm. sharing what it was that was hidden in that corner? It, it was a, like there had been a childhood game some years earlier where, <clears throat> which basically involved um, kids from a summer camp hitting each other with small plastic bowling pins. And I refused to participate in this game. And what I told myself about that for some number of years was I'm refusing to participate in this game because it's a negative sum game. Like, as a matter of ideals, I'm not going to, like, trade being hurt for the chance to hurt others. And, like, some years later, I looked back and realized, like, no, I just hadn't wanted to be hurt. And, like, that was the actual reason I'd refused. I'd made up this sort of idealistic story afterwards. And I'd known somewhere in the back of my mind why I'd actually done it. I'd known the idealistic story was false. I just had these two beliefs going at the same time. And I was like, aha, like, I see this belief. I see, the, like, the truth that I always knew in the corner of my mind being pushed aside by this thing that I'm saying. Now I understand this feeling. That is fantastic. How old were you? Um, 
probably something in the range of eight-ish during the original Bowling Pins episode, or actually maybe it was closer to 11-ish? I'm not sure. I, it's, it's hard to remember if I actually did know about game theory at the time or not, <laughs> and like what a positive sum or negative sum game was. If I knew what game theory was, then I was probably closer to 11. Um, and when I first like noticed that feeling of hiding something in the corner of my mind and generalizing over it, uh, that would have been age 14 or 15, I think. Okay. Was uh, I, I got the feeling from reading the less wrong sequences that you had a very religious upbringing, which I found is not uncommon among rationalists to break away from a religious upbringing. Did that have a big influence too? Um, it probably had like a sort of initially getting it wrong influence. Like, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I would say I had a very religious upbringing. I had a very Jewish upbringing. It's not quite the same thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> like modern Orthodox Judaism. Um, so there was probably like another watershed moment when I was five or six when they were telling me to pray to Davin. And I was like, I don't understand these words. This is not going to work. And they're like, no, no. Like, as long as you Davin in Hebrew, it's okay if you don't understand the words. And this was so stupid <laughs> that I figured that there had to have been something lost in the translation between, like, God and my being told this thing. So, like, from that moment on, I was a heretic. Excellent. There were things that I was officially supposed to believe that I did not believe. So I still believe in God, but, like, I already didn't believe in the exact Jewish religion ver version of God, though I wouldn't have, like, self-identified as a heretic. I would have just been like, no, they clearly got this wrong somehow. Um, <clears throat> so I think that the effect this had on me was indeed something of the same thing that I've seen other uh, rationalists get from growing up with one crazy parent, which is it breaks your trust in authority. Mm -hmm. And there were like larger life traumas than that, which like helped to break my trust in authority. But, um, like, if you were to, like, ask of the, like, sort of earliest life memory of rejecting what is being presented to you as, as the uh, authoritative adult view of reality, it would be that moment where I was like, that can't possibly be what God wants. Yeah. It's Although, if, if praying to God is like a function call, you technically don't have to know what it means, as long as you execute the call yes, correctly. Well, well, if, if, if the modern Orthodox Jewish God existed, Prem would not be like a function call. <laughs> I stand by my younger self. Um, I mean, it might be a bit of a vacuous truth, but I like stand with my younger self on this one. This right. is like a good inference made for good reasons. Do you think it's very important for good rationalists to have that break with authority figures? Um, because I know that I've, I've I guess seen you seen you talk a little bit about how it's important to trust people with a great deal more experience than you or when you don't have the information that you need i think that there's a difference between sort of trusting people because it's an option versus like trusting people because you're scared of what happens to people who don't trust authority mm -hmm. <clears throat> um and, uh, sorry, just a second. My, my headphones just told me battery low. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess if, I, I guess if that gets worse, then you might have to call me back and I might have to call you back on regular Skype, but hopefully we'll be all right. Okay. That's not a problem. If we cut out, then yeah. we'll just await your return call. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, to get back to the previous question, um, the, I think that it's imp that there's an important formative experience wherein you challenge the authoritative view and turn out to be right so that you get some positive feedback for it. You like, understand that you have the right to try to arrive at your own opinions about things. Like, you don't always have to exercise that right. But, like, a sense of, like, there was this one time I tried to form my own opinion, and it didn't go horribly wrong. Awesome. And, if, and religion? 
is a pretty good place to get that formative experience. I mean, yeah. it sure beats trying to do it with quantum physics, you know? <laughs> right. It's my experience that religion's a good warm-up exercise for basically any rationalist or skeptic technique. Uh, so I, moving on, um, this is something I've been wanting to ask for a while. So, uh, so there's been a bit of a diaspora in the rationalism sphere uh, since you hung up your blogging hat. And I was wondering, have you ever considered taking a blogging again? And if so, if there's like any topic you'd really be interested in giving another in-depth sequence about. So to do my, so like to do the less wrong sequences, like I was doing nothing else for two years, oh. um, like other, other projects, uh, such as the, the then Singularity Institute did suffer as a result of like my attention being elsewhere. And like it and I was like doing one post every day rain or shine sometimes giving myself little vacations by posting rationality quotes collections but like basically just just keeping up the case keeping up the volume it was a time of my life when the rest of the world wasn't paying very much attention to me and I didn't have to take meetings with people it would be pretty hard to get up that momentum again I think um, <clears throat> I would also want better tools <laughs> Some of which are under development. What do you mean by better tools? Um, so, like, if I was doing the less wrong sequences over again with the tools that I had available um, at the time, then I would be using both a wiki and a blog. And when I like wrote about a new concept, I would create a wiki page for it, and then like link future blog posts to the wiki page instead of the previous blog posts. So it's like untangle the giant spaghetti mess of dependencies that, that rapidly grew up. Right. Um, and today, like there's a friend of mine named Alexei who's working on a project called Arbital, which will be sort of like that, only even better. Huh. So if I do the blogging again, it will probably be there. In fairness, the giant tangle spaghetti mess was one of the fun aspects of it that really got me to it, <laughs> through it. Well, yes, but there's like a right way and a wrong way to do the giant tangled spaghetti mess. And the right way is TV tropes, where you're bouncing yes. back and forth between the tropes and the shows. So, like, the correct way to do the giant spaghetti mess would have been to, like, bounce people back and forth between wiki pages about concepts that listed blog posts talking about the concepts and blog posts full of links to wiki pages. So that would have been the right way to do it. Okay. Do you, like, I know you don't have the time right now, so you're not going to, but was there, like, any specific topic that you'd really just want to get your teeth into if you had the time? I mean, I think my my priorities for blogging, if I was in a blogging environment, would be to just, like, massive brain dump all the stuff about the AI alignment problem. Because, mm -hmm. like, Bless for Wrong didn't go very far into that. It's, like, only going there far enough to, like, tell you that there is such a thing as this problem and not logical decision theory and tiling agents problem and how we know the orth and, and, and like how we know what the orthogonality thesis is true and introduction to AI XI and ideal analysis of unbounded agents and epistemic efficiency and instrumental efficiency and, and, and did, 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 did. like there's this enormous body of knowledge that's basically being passed around verbally between people who are at working in the field and I try to blog that that does sound fantastic uh, did, you, did you want to jump to yours or should I do the methods of rationality question no, no, go ahead oh okay uh, well uh, since I'm expecting to get some listeners maybe from the methods of rationality podcast we we got to get a couple questions in about that so uh, I, I know you've written the original universe works before since you know I, I read a lot of them and and podcasted some of them but so uh, why a fanfic and why Harry Potter in specific as opposed to some other universe? Well, <clears throat> Harry Potter in particular, because I had been reading a large amount of Harry Potter fan fiction online. And so when this story spontaneously burped itself into existence inside my mind, it happened to burp itself into existence as a Harry Potter story, like not in the same form that you saw, like the very first version of the story that popped into my head had Harry watching in, in horror in the Philosopher's Stone Chamber as Snape crucio the face on the back of Coral's head into insanity. <laughs> like that was, that, so like there was a whole lot of uh, free mind outlining 
and like changing things around and adding plot elements and so on. And the like, the, the version that will probably sound a little bit more familiar to people who have read or watched Death Note is um, <clears throat> Yagami Light is older and smarter and has 300 core cruxes, one of which is the Pioneer plaque. Headmaster L is pretending to be insane. And then into the middle of their duel wanders a young Miles Rokosigan starting Hogwarts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like that, that, that version probably sounds a little, a, a little bit more familiar, but I thought I should mention the like early, early version just to sort of like establish the, the fact that that plans change and, and like you shouldn't think that, that the original vision for the story is anything that has to survive. And why fanfic? Um, because it was easy to write at the time, like it stayed easy to write up until the end of the Azkaban arc and then stopped being easy for reasons I wouldn't start to figure out until many years later. But I was working on an attempted nonfiction rationality book and writing was going really slowly. So I was like, okay, can I write faster if it's this like completely goofy just for fun thing? Like there are these people now making up stories about how HPMOR was an elaborate plot, like from the very beginning and et cetera, et cetera. And like these people don't understand how writing works, you know, like it was just like, okay, I can write this thing really quickly. Okay. It's good enough that I, that that's worth throwing up on fanfiction.net. Uh, okay. It seems to have accumulated 1000 reviews very quickly. <laughs> I will put more effort into this. And eventually the nonfiction book ended up going nowhere because I was like forcing myself to write it. And the thing that I wasn't forced, forcing myself to write ended up being the super popular thing. And, you know, this is a story that one finds repeated many other times in another context. Yeah. What, what if, I, if you don't mind me asking, what was the thing that you found out many years later was really hard and then slowed you down after Azkaban? Um... <clears throat> So many years later, I worked out that there were a couple of things I was doing wrong. Um, one of the things was that by writing a story consisting of entirely foreshadowing, I was adding on more and more constraints that had to be satisfied by the later sections. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I was doing wrong was I had pro started promising my readers to post at particular times and dates after um, finding that people were frantically trying to refresh the, the story page like <laughs> every five minutes yeah. because they wanted their hit of HPMOR, a <laughs> phenomenon I would later compare to being a heroin dealer oh. who has to knit all of the heroin out of his own eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, okay, I will like only post at this particular time of day, and that was a and that was a mistake. That meant that I had to rush to get stuff done by that time if I wanted to post it that day. And instead of this like calm, relaxing, relieved, yay feeling of all right, I finished the thing. Now I get to go post it. Now I would finish and be waiting 30 minutes for the reward, or I'd be rushing, 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 and have to like post it at at that time if I wanted to get it up that day. So. That was um, that was like the the small thing that like changed the reinforcement dynamics of what happened to me when I was writing, and was just like me being clumsy, not understanding how the human reinforcement system worked. Right. I just want to jump in really quick on that. Speaking of, I guess the positive experience of writing it, uh, on a scale of one to a hundred, how much fun was it from your end to watch? the subreddit explode after the final <laughs> exam. <laughs> um, well, I mean, like, some of the explosions prior to that were a little bit more fun than the explosion for the final exam itself. Like, it was, so I, I mean, like, maybe 80 or something, because on the one hand, it was, like, nicely evil, and the other, uh, on the other <laughs> hand, I was sort of, like, horribly aware of the fact that this puzzle that I had designed at before chapter one had been published, like the solution is there in the like in the like first three lines of, of HPMOR, right? So it was this puzzle that I had designed with like five years worth of negative writing skill accumulation. And this gigantic subreddit was trying to solve it and coming up with better solutions that I'd envisioned. And it was too late. All the foreshadowing was already in place. I couldn't use their solutions. I had to use the real foreshadowing. Mm. Oh, I hear you. 
Okay, well, I all right. I've got a little bit of an egotistical question because <laughs> I've always really been curious about this, but I never actually asked your permission before I started the podcast, and I still kind of feel guilty about that. And like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering what you thought when you first heard that some random jerk was podcasting your f fanfic, and uh, and if your opinion has changed at all now that it's done. Um, probably something like a. Um, a flash of pride, uh, senses being honored, and some amount of banging my head in, against the wall about how much easier it was to get people to, like, put in large amounts of paid, uncoordinated volunteer work on things related to Harry Potter fan fiction <laughs> than to saving the actual world. Right. I, I mean, like, like, we're doing a little better on the second metric nowadays. Yeah. Like, um, we now have, like, better volunteer coordinators, but I was, like, sort of like, gosh, it's like, sure it's easier to get people to do the sort of, like, fun, humanly comprehensible stuff that, that carries immediate emotional rewards than yeah. it is to, like, work on the longer range stuff, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, to this day, I suspect that we, that, like, I, I, like, sometimes wonder whether, like, there are friendly AI problems that could just be solved if I could get the same number of mathematicians working on it with the same intensity as was, was trying to solve the final exam. So the volunteers that you're looking for, are they highly skilled mathematicians? Um... <clears throat> Those are people coming to workshops. Like, again, remember, like, stuff has changed over time. So, like, at the time, I was thinking of these, like, sort of various failed attempts that the then Singularity Institute had made to get volunteers to, I don't know, translate stuff or, uh, like, clean up after a Singularity Summit or something. And, like, nowadays we are, like, better about volunteers on that score. Um, and so, like... Uh, like, we have systems in place for, like, various volunteer things where I unfortunately don't know the details or what type of volunteers we're looking for currently. But if you happen to be a highly skilled mathematician, then you go to intelligence.org and go to the contact section and, and are like, hey, can I come to one of your workshops? And then you come to one of our workshops and thus, like, start down the pipeline for contributing to the research area. Thanks for the tip. Yeah. Yeah. So um, taking this in a little bit of a different direction, some of the audience that we want to reach out to are people who are new to Less Wrong or new to the rationality community and maybe know only a little bit about it. Um, so if someone were to adopt only one or two rational skills or habits, which do you think are the most vital? It varies by the person and what they've mastered already. I think that, like... For a lot of people, there's a very critical realization where you realize that there is this um, <clears throat> art form of adapting your beliefs to the way the universe is, which is completely separate from the skill of arguing, and that just because you can come up with an argument for both sides of, of, of an issue doesn't mean that you have, like, now done your duty to it and analyzed it and it's uncertain or undecided or even, like, um, like even, like, the state of it is that there are arguments for both sides. There's, like, a fact of the matter. You're trying to figure out what the fact of the matter is. Um, for other people, the, the most important realization might be the one that Philip Tetlock describes in the Good Judgment Project of, like, you can be a better predictor. Like, that was the thing that, that Philip Tetlock's uh, super forecasters all had in, in, in common. They believed that super forecasting was possible. <laughs> they believed that, like, you could develop skills about it and that you, you could have, like, better probability judgments than other, the other people in the project. <laughs> Uh, or the like median person of the project. So for some people who are sort of like being held back by their own sense of modesty or thinking that like um, it is, is like sinful to try to develop your own beliefs and like not to try to find another source to get your own beliefs from that is like more authoritative. Like for those people, the, the, the realization that like they can actually try to figure things out on their own might be the most important realization. And for other people, the most important realization might be that they should actually start reading the literature and look at what other people think and um, have argued, especially when, like, lots of people agree on what the critical arguments are and, like, not try to do everything on their own. Um, it, it varies by the person. 
Do you think that through your work on the sequences and as a blogger that you've made a significant impact on helping people be better predictors? Well, I haven't had a significant average impact on the median human being on Earth yet, growth mindset, but there's clearly <laughs> like a very large number of readers who like <clears throat> acquired more accurate belief and probably more accurate belief finding skills about some important things. But like, even if the number is pretty large in absolute sense, I don't really know how large a fraction was. There's, um, there's like a real sense in which Left Wrong was taking down a very hard problem of like getting people to make better predictions. And it was like striking this very hard problem with a very soft bat. Like the, the bat is like reading a couple of years worth of blog posts. And there are people who can be moved by that bat, but they're not necessarily a majority. So what's a, what's a harder bat? What's the best way to spread those principles and help p- people in general be better predictors? I'm not sure I have much of an improved answer over that, like CIFAR workshops, good judgment project, extended participation, betting in prediction markets. Um, see, like universities aren't all about collecting rents on prestige and employment. Like there's also a fairly hard problem with teaching people things that universities solve at least some of the time mm-hmm. or, or they used to. I don't know. I haven't checked to see how, how well they're still doing at it. But like to actually cause people to acquire a real life skill and like resistance to common errors. It, it feels like what you really want to do is like <clears throat> go to a university that is like a correctly designed university for six months and, and less like write your blog post a slightly different way. Okay. okay thank you so much. <laughs> I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to talk with us here. I know that we're coming up on our last few minutes, so I'll skip one of my questions, and if you don't like the question I settle on, I'll go back to the first question. (laughs) Um, I've always wanted to kind of ask you about this, since this is, you know, I think the the end condition, which is, you know, some years from now, you know, assuming it's in the next, uh, or, you know, in the foreseeable future, you and your team have gone over the code, everything looks great, and you hit enter and start the AI program. I'm... And, you know, then super intelligence is born. And I guess I know that, you know, obviously there's event horizon problems, but then, you know, just speculating wildly if you want, what sort of, what's your imagination of what happens one hour later, one week later, one year later? Well, I'm going to sort of parenthetically quibble about the, the part where there's a notion of you to like check the code and then you switch the AI on. Like you, you, you like have an AI that has been running and learning and you've been moderating, mo- monitoring its operations for a while as it's been gradually going in strength. And then you like, at, at some point, perhaps you like pull out the, the stopper and, and let it do things you would not have let it do previously. Um, but not like you, you write the code, you check the code, you, you switch it on. Like, and it, like any AI has to learn a whole bunch of stuff before it can do a whole bunch of stuff. So leave, leaving that parenthetical aside, <clears throat> um, I will launch into another parenthetical, <laughs> which is the difference between genies and sovereigns. So like, if you want an AI to just, if you want to just like free an AI and say, do whatever you think is best, um, that might be a harder design problem than if you have an AI that you want to do things like, um, I, I mean, let's paint the cars pink is an example that we sometimes use. Like, paint all the cars pink. Just paint them pink. Don't tile the universe with pink painted cars. Like, don't maximize the level of pinkness to the point where the pink light is evaporating nearby buildings. Just paint the, the darned cars pink. And like, this itself is already a very difficult and lethal problem, or so we suspect. Like, if you want an AI that that does things with that, that like sort of can like do term things that you actually meant it to do and not have an insane number of side effects and not rewrite the programmers in order to give better orders, et cetera, et cetera. Like this itself is already a like potentially 
very hard and lethal problem. And depending on whether you solve the genie problem or the sovereign problem, what happens a week later um, probably looks very different. For sure. I like I like the, the pink car problem. That sounds like the, the leveled up version of the paperclip maximizer. But I guess, and I, I don't want to push it, but say things go great. What, is, what does great look like? Um, it looks like concrete instantiation of the fun theory sequence from mm -hmm. Les Ross. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't finish that one because he prefaced it by saying something along the lines of reading this could... Uh, well, it was there, there was some there was some intense caution that I was like, you know what, I'll put this off, and I never put it back on. Yeah, uh, see, I think I'm, I'm still a little bit worried about that caution. Like, I keep on taking stabs occasionally at writing a story set in that world, and keep on running into obstacles or writer's block uh, in writing it. And I don't know if I would like ever actually publish it if I could do it. I would like worry that if you like show people someplace that is actually a nice place to live, they might start to see the present world in a more negative light. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think that is like a, a valid thing to worry about, but I do think we can do a lot better than uh, Greg Egan's um, upload for permutation city style uploads who have nothing better to do with eternity than to learn exactly how to carve table legs for 20 years because they have like exhausted all of the actually interesting things worth doing and are now modifying their preferences to be satisfied carving table legs so the um <clears throat> Uh, I, I think we can do better than the culture where people are just sort of wandering around at the mercy. Well, not, not the mercy. I mean, the machines have mercy, but the, the people are basically useless and they know it. Right. Like the only reason they exist is because AIs are refraining from doing certain things in order to give people a reason to exist. And I think we can do better than that too. But like, if you want to know what specifically an optimal scenario looks, looks like, then um, I think we're, I mean, I have ideas, but I think I would prefer not to try to encapsulate them in the next 60 seconds. That, that's totally fine. I appreciate the answer. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we are right about the end of the half hour, so um, we can we can let you go now if, if you have things to get on to. Um, I can stick around for an extra five minutes, I think, if um, you want me to. Uh, Stephen, did you want to go with that first question that you had then? Um, yeah, if, if you want to give a quick soundbite answer, um, I've been really excited to see AI in the news a lot lately, even though a lot of it's kind of fear intensive, you know, like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking have been talking a lot about it. I was particularly excited that Sam Harris was talking about it. You know, he has a big audience with the skeptic and, and atheist community, and I think that he, I think his next book is actually going to be on AI and this whole thing, and I, I'm excited to see that the audience is getting bigger. Do you have any thoughts or feelings about, I guess, AI and pop news lately? Well, I, I feel like it's basically not covering any of the real ideas or arguments. Um, like, I, I am not quite sure what the deep problem is with journalism in modern society that prevents them from covering any of the real ideas or arguments ever, but they're still putting photos of the Terminator <laughs> marching armies of robots with glowing red eyes rather than like a more accurate depiction of what the problem is, which might be like a tiny sphere inside someone's bloodstream releasing um, plutonium toxin and 10,000 years later, a picture of the Milky Way with a 10,000 light year radius sphere gapped out on it, centered where the Earth used to be. So, like, you, you, you still don't see, like, the real deal. You don't, you don't see the actual arguments. You don't see the actual ideas. You don't see... Um, you, you, don't, you, don't, you, you, you still see the concept of, like, robotic cars causing unemployment is AI anxiety and it's on an equal level with the 10,000 light year sphere gapped out of the Milky Way anxiety. Like to them, it's all the same thing. It all blurs together. They, they don't have any, they don't have any concrete model of it. They don't have a notion of like an actual world world corresponding to, to the words they're, they're emitting. Um, 
it, to them, it's all just like words, words, and more words about AI anxiety, and all the, and all the words are equal, and it's just this one big blur. And that's the kind of impression I get when I read the stuff in the media. That and a lot of people talking without bothering to familiarize themselves with the arguments that they think they're arguing against. So one word answer is that it would say it's a net positive or net negative that it's being talked about more. I I mean, like based on the events that have actually happened recently, um, if there are positives, they have yet to materialize, and the negatives are kind of obvious. So, uh, I mean, like maybe that will change in the foreseeable future, but at least for now, like the consequences so far have not been what I would call positive. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, one last thing before you go, we were wondering, did you want to tease any of our listeners with hints about the upcoming Methods of Rationality epilogue, like when it might be released <laughs> or the time frame of the, the setting of the epilogue? Um, well, the time frame I had planned was at the beginning of their seventh year of Aha. Uh -huh. Whoops. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I read that question and I realized that I think that was in your announcement of the epilogue. So now I regret it. <laughs> any, 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 any additional information? <laughs> so, so, so your voice suddenly went a bit softer there, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I mean, like, not in terms of additional information, but I will mention parenthetically that I do not regret giving, for example, significant digits a lot of time to run as like the uh, best HPMOR continuation fic, um, not competing with the author's personal conception of what might have happened later. Cause you know, no matter, it, it, even if I can like write a really awesome epilogue, it's not going to contain like as much net meat as significant digits, the right. continuation fan fiction bit. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Further facts I can tease readers with. Well, maybe this one's kind of obvious, but Luna Lovegood will be in there. Hey! <laughs> awesome, I think. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time. And although you couldn't see us, all of us were nodding constantly while you were talking. <laughs> and often grinning like idiots. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, we really appreciate it, and we hope you have a great night. You warm the cold abysses of my heart. And you have a great <laughs> night as well. Excellent. Thanks, Bye. Thanks again. Bye. So, yeah, I had a question for you guys because I was a little bit confused. Hold up. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. Um, my question was regarding Eliezer's answer about um, what a, a a perfect AI world would be, mm -hmm. perfect general AI world would be. And he one explained the sovereign versus the genie. Yes. So could you, I guess for the listeners, explain a little bit what the sovereign is and what the genie is? I was actually going to ask him about the sovereign because I was not familiar with that term. If I had to guess, so I think- Don't that... guess. Do, do, do you have a good idea? I, I've I've heard of what I think fits. I've never heard it by that name, mm -hmm. but I I think that there are uh, two different scenarios I've heard talked about. Are we Are you thinking about Singleton? I don't know. Okay, I, I'm thinking one is the the machine that you can come to and say, Hey, how do you cure Alzheimer's? Oh, do this. Okay. And the other one is the one that has a more active role. So the one one's the genie that can give you the answer to any question you want, and the other one maybe is the sovereign that has the the, the heavier hand okay. and actually does things rather than just answers questions. Okay. Um, and now I feel bad for the stupid phrasing on my question about you press enter and start. Because I know that you would start it with, you know, like a, a closed Ethernet and make it think it had access to the real Internet. And then okay. at some point, then you plug it into to whatever else it needs to get into. But Yeah, we were coming up with questions, you know, yeah. as best we could. And, and he mentioned that he was disappointed and he didn't quite know what was wrong with journalism today. Hmm. And I don't know if this is a complete answer, but I think it's part of it is that online journalism is written for people who written for the audience that doesn't know how to use ad block. <laughs> so, wow I, I, that's fair I, I think yeah. I, I mean I, I'm that's just sad. guessing right. but I, I think that's probably part of it so like they're not going to be looking to write for an audience about you know nuanced uh, discussion of, of the paperclip 
maximizer. They're going to post get a picture of the Terminator. Ten and like, ways the world is going to end. <laughs> Number four, we'll shock you. <laughs> I, I get a feeling a lot of people just have one general upper bound to anxiety that they're like, oh God, the AI is going to take my job and I'm going to starve to death is as anxious as, oh God, the entire Milky Way is going to be wiped out because it kind of feels the end result is the same either way to them, right? Isn't that known I'm as scope dead. insensitivity? Yeah. That's what I was going to yeah. say. And I think that's exactly right in that just like we feel you know, just as bad about one person dying as we do about 10 million dying. Cause like you can only feel so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I'm thinking e even if it goes up a little, it does not go up by a factor of a hundred billion. When I think about like how much it would suck to like suddenly be homeless because a, and a robot took my job versus like, man, that would suck. You know, what suck a little bit more is that the whole universe is destroyed. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, man. I loved his story about being a kid mm. and, and that game with the, the plastic bowling pins you know it reminded me just while he was saying that i had been telling somebody about how i boycotted professional sports oh. because i didn't like um i didn't like how it was glorifying violence and how people were you know pretty much being paid to give themselves concussions and um, and, I, and I thought that was horrible. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going back to the moment that I said, that's it, I'm boycotting sports. And it was right after the guy behind me dropped an entire beer on me. <laughs> Is that the real reason? It could be. And not that idealist. Maybe that put you over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I liked the general lesson from that, I think, is to make a concerted effort to know when you're lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. So like... Um, one example from someone else's life, Sam Harris talked about in one of his books, actually this book called Lying, um, how he was offered the to give the valedictorian speech at whatever university he attended. And he was like, no, someone who's been here all four years should probably do it, you know, because I think he transferred there. Hmm. And it wasn't until later that he admitted to himself it's because he had a terrifying or he was terrified of public speaking. Ah. And if he had been willing to admit that to himself earlier, he would have forced himself to go through with it. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of jobs where we put people through a lot worse physical things that they get paid a lot less for. Like coal miners in general have drastically reduced quality and length of life, mm -hmm. and we don't pay them shit compared to what we pay professional sports athletes. And their their jobs would be replaced a lot sooner by robots, and their lives will probably be much worse as a result than like the average football player's job would be. Right, but I'm saying no one's boycotting you know things oh, made know. from coal. Yeah, no, I was just because of the violence it does to the miners' I, bodies. I I think that people are. Are they? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think there's impossible an environmental. To do that because you difficult. can't boycott electricity in Colorado. N no, but you can. You like can try get, to get 80%. renewable. You can try to make sure that your your energy in your home comes from renewable resources, mm -hmm. and make those efforts. And there are certainly people who are very concerned about environmental justice, and um, and what happens to to workers. There was a really stupid movie about that, too. So maybe it was at least partly about the violence. <laughs> I saw somebody on what Reddit was, talking about... stupid movie? Oh. I think it was called Beneath. Don't watch it. Oh, wait. Okay. That's probably rude. We should cut that out. Okay. Why? If it's a terrible movie, let people know. Don't watch Beneath. Katrina didn't like the movie Beneath. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. That, that, it that, is Beneath I, Her. That can't be contested. Oh, that was no. terrible. I'm sorry. No, no. that's fine. Um, uh, so, oh, speaking of boycotting, there was... Uh, a post on Reddit about that, and someone said they were, you know, how hard it is to boycott coal mining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone said they're, they boycott Nestle because they're like, if you like did your best to be like an evil corporation, that's like Nestle. Mm -hmm. um, and someone's like, yeah, good luck. And they linked to Nestle's Wikipedia page of their products, and it's like right. everything that you buy to eat, and sometimes things that you don't even eat, like water. Right. So there's like what six Uber Corps that contain eighty that uh, are responsible for eighty ninety percent of what we could, uh, consume. I haven't heard that, but I believe that. I believe it's something along that line, yeah. So, going back to the interview. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people that I really admire over the past few years. Or not interviewed, but interacted with. But I still I get that, that rush sometimes. Like, coming up to here, even an hour beforehand, I was like, yeah, yeah, this is cool. I'm used to this. I got this down. And then as soon as he answers the phone, I'm like, oh my god, it's still the <laughs> I think I was, I think I was more freaking out two hours ago than I was during the thing. Yeah. Never, so I got, because I, I was just focused on listening. Okay. And then I was like, oh wait, this is Elias Zudkowski, that guy who like I listen to on podcast, or on, you know, YouTube and stuff. It's like, oh, that, that makes it, it's like, when I had that kind of flip, you know, like when you're watching a movie and then suddenly you realize like you're watching the movie projected on a screen in your movie ah. theater. like every time i had that switch to realize like oh this is actually happening and like 
so that was kind of exciting. I don't mm. know. I don't want to sit here and nerd out about it, but <laughs> there it is. We're excited. It was fun. Were you excited? I was so excited. <laughs> I was dead poor. <laughs> Steven had to kick me to keep me awake. <laughs> Steven didn't kick me. He's lying. It's true. I did make an effort not to kick this, though. Yeah. There we go. I mean, I have a, I have a water glass next to me, and we're... Um, I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but we're broadcasting from Stephen <laughs> Zuber International Studios. I believe we're calling it um, or... Stephen's Closet, <laughs> and <laughs> we we have this this nice little setup where our legs are next to each other, and we can let people imagine that we have a studio. It's up to you guys. <laughs> um, I feel bad. I didn't mean to to push on the AI thing. Uh, I hope I didn't no, okay. come off confrontational. But Jesus, Steven, you go stop over this it. all the time. Steven always thinks that he's all confrontational and pushy and everything. We're like, Steven's never pushy. No, he's like the nicest guy. He's I, like, hey, can I offer you a glass of water? I'm sorry, that was too pushy. And we're like, Jesus, Steven. <laughs> I felt like this. I felt like I was the only one who challenged him on an answer he gave. <laughs> I think it went. It was fine. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, he didn't say, "Dude, shut the hell up." That's rude. But yeah. I mean, I was like, I, I did, I did. I was the only one who said that answer is not good enough. Can you try again? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but no, and I, I get that's not a question that I think if it was a question that could be answered easily in five minutes, it would have been answered easily already. Right. Um, but I, I did, I did a, a, I can check that off my my to do list of ask Elias Yudkowsky what the post singularity world looks like so yeah cool all right so, so I, when I, he was when list. he was talking about what the post singularity world would look like he mentioned oh it would look like and then referred to i guess his fun theory sequence what is that uh it's a sequence about what makes life actually interesting and fun for humans and, okay. and why most utopias that people think of are actually really shitty if you think of them. The PDF version I downloaded of all the sequences back before they were like organized, mm -hmm. I could have sworn it opened with a quote saying this could like radically reduce your utility or something. Really? I I need to find that and the I'll, fun, I'll look to it. The fun series. Yes, I remember being spooked away from it, but now I'm looking at this and I've read, I've read at least some of this because I knew about that analogy. Yeah. I knew about, I mean, he talks about uh, how like the idea of like Christian heaven Sounds oh, great God. if you're a dark no. ages peasant. <laughs> right. Like in your you know, you're working eighteen hours a day, your life's terrible, you always hurt. It's so like you go to a place where you don't have to work and you don't hurt and you just get to relax all the time. But then like a week later you're like sitting there just bored to death because like, like sitting on a cloud taking harp lessons like gets really dry really well, fast. Well, the good news is you get to look into hell and see all your loved ones who weren't saved suffering. Yeah. Wait, I shouldn't have said that. Christian <laughs> heaven, the way rough. it was always explained to me, sounded basically like an unending heroin hit. I was like, Oh, so we have heaven on earth it's not a big deal you just inject heroin whoa there <laughs> well no seriously it's it's just you know blissed out happiness right guys don't inject heroin no he don't inject heroin to all religious people <laughs> substitute religion with heroin <laughs> i just i'm saying the christian heaven that i was taught was basically you know blissed out happy which which is heroin and you know a lot of heroin junkies love it and live for it but i think there's there's more to life than just unending bliss yeah so i think that uh, now i I'm sure I've read some of this because I remember the counter argument too to the idea that uh, some people argue that we have a moral obligation to make the future of humanity just one big orgasmatron machine. All right, the super happies. And, but I think less fulfilled than the super happies. They seem to at least you know they they wanted to fly around. So maybe they're flying to the sun or to the supernova just like to get resources to keep building more super happies or something. Mm -hmm. But I got the impression that they had more to life than just laying in pure bliss, right? Right. They're uh, incredibly intelligent, constantly, yeah, constantly exploring the universe, making new things, integrating other cultures potentially. I got the feeling that it was really only the. Uh... God, what was the term for the super mother overmind thing that took control really quickly? Uh, the the Kitsarugu? Or something like that? Uh, something like that. Yeah, I got the feeling that there was only like... Kiritsugu. Kiritsugu? Yeah, I got the feeling that the Kiritsugu was the only actual human type thing we would recognize on that ship and everything else was just, you know, orgy time all the time. They're like, oh, hey, look, there's some people to party with here. Hey. Big fucking Edward seemed like he's ready to talk too. <laughs> yes. And I always pictured him like Jack Donaghy from Third Rock. <laughs> oh, <okay>. oh, my. <laughs> I mean, well, it describes, you know, some immaculate guy in a suit or something, and I, or didn't it? And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm picturing Alec Baldwin. Absolutely. So now we know what Steven's type is. <laughs> the take charge man. kind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't like distinguished old men, right? 
No. Okay. So what we were what we were referring I'm to, to remember, I'm is trying to remember Iron Man's real name. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. That's the one. Yeah. Fuck yeah. What we were referring to was like Tony Stark. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> was um what was the name the baby eaters and the super happy was the name of that three worlds collide three worlds collide um which is a fictional essay by eliezer yukowski the person we just had on yeah. so um you should check that out and since enosh probably isn't going to say so there is an audiobook version of oh. that available online if you want to just listen to it on your commute rather than take the time to sit and read what like eight chapters it's not long yeah but it's a fun dive into the subject of meta ethics yeah. Oh shoot! You know what I wish that we had asked? Hmm. If he had anything to plug. Oh. But we can still ask that. So. Okay. Here, I'm charging you, Ineash, yeah. to contact Eliezer and ask him what he wants to, what he wants to plug, what he wants to promote, Excellent. so that we can make sure that we include it. And then we'll insert that right at the end of his interview, or right here. Okay, so Eliezer brought up some interesting concepts, some of which we feel like we should clarify now that the interview's over. He brought up, for example, some different kinds of super intelligences that could exist, including um, a genie and a sovereign. So for all of these, we've included links on the website, so you can go to the Bayesian Conspiracy dot com and go to episode three and you'll be able to see all of these in much greater detail but does anybody want to take a quick stab at defining a sovereign what a sovereign ai would look like and what a genie ai would look like i will pr uh, preface this by saying that uh this terminology comes from nick bostrom's book super intelligence which is a not foundational but fairly important work nowadays in in the ai field not in the ai mm. field I actually have in the, the AI communication okay. department, absolutely. There we go. I have very basic definitions right here. Um, if you follow the link, you'll see exactly this. So a genie is an AI that carries out a high-level command, then waits for another. And then a sovereign is an AI that acts autonomously in the world in pursuit of potentially long-range objectives. Okay. So the the distinction is basically: Do you want to create a Do you want to create a god? that is going to run the universe for you, but do it hopefully in the best way possible? Or do you want to make one that sits in a box and waits to do things that you ask it to do? Also, um, it could be the genie from those horror books that we read when we were kids. Right. <laughs> the monkey paw side <clears throat> effects. Yeah. And um, they're always going to misinterpret what you want and do something evil. Believe it or not, there is a website, and I can find it if we want to link to it, where people have worked to articulate the best wish yeah that so in the event that just in case you ever run into a genie yeah if you ever yeah, run into it's an a intellectual genie, exercise and it's along the lines of like I, I wish that i can continue to persist in my current state of mind etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah it, it's um, like seven paragraphs of disclaimers and caveats <laughs> and things so the genie will not misinterpret your words in any way <laughs> Something else that Eliezer brought up was the fun theory sequence about what a an ideal world would look like if everything went perfectly. So I did some reading on that because in the interview I had mentioned that I didn't read that sequence in its entirety. And then when I was going through reading it again, or I guess reading it for partially the first time, I've read at least half of it before because a lot of it's familiar, but it essentially outlines utopia in a way that doesn't suck. <laughs> it's one of its core theses is that standard utopia ideas are terrible and that if you actually imagine living them for like a month things get really boring really fast so it's a fun distillation of that general hypothesis and the link to it on the web on our website contains what 31 mm -hmm. short summaries of all the posts so 31 it, laws of fun yes it's also a decent treatise on what makes is that the right word treaties treatise 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 <laughs> treatise treatise okay uh on what makes human existence um fun and uh, you know what makes existence for a human a human thing as opposed to being a robot um but a uh, in addition to being fun to read, it's also probably a thing that anyone aspiring to write a utopia or even dystopia story might want to look into, just because it covers a lot of the basics that sometimes you read a utopia story and you're like, this is stupid. No one would like this this world. Yeah, or or, or missing really any one of the, of the 31 laws of fun is basically a recipe for, for dystopia. You know, novel entertainment as opposed to just repeating the same pleasurable thing over and over and uses the analogy of, you know, playing a great video game, 
but doing the same one more than a few times gets really boring, and changing the colors of the characters on the screen isn't enough to make it novel again. So, yeah, but little little things like that. Neat. And then off-air, we asked Eliezer if he had anything that he wanted to plug. And Eliezer said that he would like to plug a new website that he's been working to develop called Arbital. We will include a link again on the episode three page. Uh, this is... Uh, What's up right now is bare bones, just launching, doing some beta testing. But this is a resource for explaining things to people. It's kind of like the he's hoping that it will become one day the Wikipedia of explaining concepts. And it starts out with a explanation of Bayes' theorem. And it's supposed to be things that as you're going, there's hoverovers that will you know, pop up more detail if you want it. That can explain it at various levels of complexity, depending on how much you already know. And hopefully we'll one day also cover things like arguments so that instead of having the same damn theist versus atheist argument for the 10 millionth time on reddit you can just point people at this and say like look here there's the problem of evil here's the pros arguments here's the anti arguments just read it so we don't have to have this discussion i have a feeling that we'll be using this resource quite often i hope so if you know if it launches and it's useful yeah it looks fun i i of the little i saw of it so worth checking out on the website yeah so the Bayesian theorem explanation was really good. I read through it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there you have it. Um, one reviews in and it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as always, thank you so much for listening. You can email us with questions or feedback at Bayesian conspiracy podcast at gmail.com. Visit our website, the Bayesian And um, yeah, check us out. Okay. I think that's it. See you back in two weeks for the next episode of The Bayesian Conspiracy. Bye. Bye. I, I can, we, we can start the actual sign off. I, I can.